Hello everyone, how are you? I hope I find you all in good health. I'm Ari Thurger and today I'm going to talk about a heathen traditionalist left-hand path. Or is it? On this video I'm going to specifically focus on the Rune Guild, an esoteric magic group founded in Texas, United States of America in 1980 by Stephen Edred Flowers. You might also know him by the name of Edred Thorson. And why am I going to focus on this group? Well, this has to do in part with the video I have done about the common misconceptions concerning the runes, <laughs> which you can see right here by clicking on this information icon in, the, in this right upper corner, right? Now, uh, there's been a lot of modern assumptions concerning the runes, especially their use in magic, and indeed the belief they are somewhat magical in nature, and such ideas have come from modern religious constructions and esoteric interpretations, often borrowing uh, several other ideas and conceptions within other schools of magic, and uh, incorporating them into the, the runes. But the Rune Guild, this organization, this movement, has had a tremendous amount of influence concerning an idea of a Scandinavian religion and the use of runes. And it's important to focus on this because in the past 40 years or so, there's been, there has been a lot of assumptions concerning the runes, and the Old Norse religion in general, a lot of misunderstandings, misinterpretations, mis misinformation, misconceptions, and this is in great part due to modern esoteric groups that became quite famous, and people get the sources they produce or they, they construct, and are eventually led into an alternative historical past. Quite romantic, magical, but far from the truth in several points. And please, don't get me wrong, I too have a rune series, as you know it, <laughs> on this channel, where I explore the meaning and interpretation of the runes, also with a more esoteric approach, precisely, and uh, trying to bring some spiritual and philosophical ideas into the runes, to use them in divination methods, that might aid on our modern lives. But I make a clear division between what is historically, historically correct, as far as we know, and what are the modern, esoteric and spiritual approaches. I am aware that divination and methods of divination uh, with the runes are not historically accurate. And uh, this is a modern approach. But I do it anyway. But I know how to distinguish one thing from the other. And just like you, I am also trying my own spiritual and esoteric approaches, uh, creating my own path, uh, trying and failing until I succeed. But one thing is the historical past, another thing is what we do nowadays. Please, if you have the time, do watch the video I, I have recommended previously um, and uh, you will have a better idea of what I'm saying. I'm not here to judge anyone or to tell anyone that they are wrong or right, on the contrary. Take this video today as a study on modern religious manifestations as well as a study on esoteric groups and modern religious constructions. I'm going to try my best to remain as impartial as possible, as neutral as possible, so we can focus on the important points that allow us to understand these modern religious and esoteric manifestations. Mind that I am not against modern constructions and reconstructions in religion, uh, I am not against magical arts, not at all, <laughs> and the way people perform them. Everyone works with what fits into their perspectives. Everyone is trying to mix things together and come up with results. And I think that is beautiful. That is a wonderful part of being a human being. The need to discover, to try to come up with different ideas and everyone does whatever it works. That's the point precisely. 
our Western societies, after centuries of being repressed by religions such as Christianity, <laughs> after centuries of being submissive to an oppressive faith and not being able to explore our more spiritual side in order to immerse ourselves in the beauty of, of existence and life itself and our place in this world, our Western societies for the past century have finally taken a step forward to try to recover the religions of the past before Christianization. As such, a lot of modern religious movements, organizations, religious manifestations in general, have emerged. An amalgamation of ideas to try to reach a concrete idea of a pre-Christian religion. So, there's been a lot of assumptions. Quite often there's been a total disregard for the actual historical truth. Of course, history itself has been shaped and reshaped countless times for the sake of politics and political ideologies have been incorporated into these modern neo-pagan religious manifestations. So, there's plenty to work with when it comes to the study of modern religious manifestations especially neo-pagan ones, and the several attempts to recover a more indigenous religious past. And with the lack of something to hold on to, modern neo-pagan religious manifestations have often, quite often actually, borrowed several other religious cultural aspects from other indigenous religions to have something to hold on to. And this has been a problem in terms of the perception of the past, the actual historical past, because more often than not we have transported our modern perceptions and our modern worldviews into the past, and as such we have constructed an historical pagan past that never actually existed, but it is in fact a reflection of our contemporary thinking. That's a problem because we have made an historical pagan past greatly influenced and, and shaped by our modern political ideologies and modern romantic revivals. And if we want to actually recover the pagan past, we have to truly understand what was actually that pagan past. And not holding on to an alternative made-up past, which often lead us into a dead end over and over again and we are left with nothing but wrong assumptions. But if, if by any chances throughout the course of this video you get a little bit confused as to where I stand uh, due to my uh, neutrality in this video today, precisely to try to reach uh, a better understanding about the, the main subject, know that I am a person against any sort of intolerance and oppressive system. I am and I fight against racism, sexism, xenophobia, homophobia. I am against oppression, discrimination, intolerance, bigotry, injustice uh, and hatred towards any living entity. I am against anything that prevents each individual from being who they are and from expressing who they are and what defines them. Of course, sometimes I may not express this in the right way or in the correct way, because after all, I am only human and I too am the product of my own time and society. So sometimes it's hard to perceive certain things, but we are all here to learn and be educated. There's no shame in being wrong, only in refusing to learn. I'm not a racist, far from it. I am against ignorance, because ignorance is the bane of all societies. And the fear of what we don't know, or what we don't understand, has led to hatred, violence, suffering and death. I praise the ability to be rational. So, on this video I'm going to focus on the Rune Guild, because for the past 40 years, it has had a tremendous amount of influence upon the perception of Old Norse and Germanic religions and spiritualities of the past. 
picking up several schools of thought, several esoteric approaches, mostly non-European, and even the European ones are post-Christian. And there's a lot of assumptions, especially concerning the runes. Again, I repeat, I will try to remain as impartial as possible. My aim is to study this magic and esoteric group or organization due to its influence on modern ideas and perceptions towards the Old Norse and Germanic past as a whole. And I'm not here neither to try to diminish nor exalt this specific group. But I think it's important to focus on it due to the entire panorama this group or this movement or this organization created concerning the Northern European pagan past. And in the past 40 years, most people seem to have completely forgotten what they knew of the past. And there is a greater focus on modern esoteric interpretations. Again, <laughs> I think it's beautiful that everyone is doing their part, everyone is trying their best, and each day we develop new approaches to magical work and new perceptions of, of the supernatural. And we have been progressively more immersed into the occult and the spiritual, and I think that is beautiful. However, it's important to understand and know how to distinguish between the historical and the, the archaeological truth of the past, uh, as much as we know, and, uh, and learn to separate scientific academic studies from the esoteric and the spiritual. I'm not here to say that what you are doing in spiritual terms is wrong or right. No, on the contrary. I'm only here today, on this video, trying to show you that not everything is what it seems to be. And the Rune Guild is an esoteric group worth taking a look at because it's not actually easy to understand if we are in the presence of a left-hand path or if we are in the presence of a heathenism, a group really interested in a heathen reconstruction, or if we are in the presence of a traditionalism, and each one of these three esoteric currents make all the difference to understand, understand what is actually the aim of this group that has influenced entire generations in the past 40 years concerning perceptions of a Northern European pagan past. So, with no more delay, finally, <laughs> let's get started, my dear friends, please. The Rune Guild is an esoteric group, although it isn't easy to understand if it is a neo-pagan slash hidden group, or a radical traditionalist group, or a left-hand path movement, or perhaps all the above, which makes it actually a real problematic group because of the information it spreads. If it is a neo-pagan hidden group, in its esoteric approach, is actually not solely focused on a pre-Christian Northern European past, as it brings spiritual and occult ideas that never actually existed in the pre-Christian Northern European pagan past, which doesn't actually make it a neo-pagan heathen group. If it's only esoteric, we understand why the amount of ideas in this group so it's not actually interested in a pagan past and in its reconstruction, but it's a modern esoteric view. But as a modern esoteric group, it should be more careful in the assumptions it makes of the pagan past and just be straightforward. If it is a radical traditionalist group, then we understand that the aim is neither to explore uh, and reconstruct a pagan past, nor is it interested solely on a free esoteric approach and therefore not a left-hand path at all, but greatly influenced by nationalist political ideologies and creating an alternative past precisely to take advantage of those who want to recover the past and have no place to start, so they follow this group and in truth they are following a political view 
and not a religious reconstructionism. So what exactly is the Rune Guild and what is their aim? It's complicated actually, because all of these characterizations spoken previously fit into the Rune Guild, but obviously provide us with different and highly conflicting portrayals of this movement. And since in the past 40 years, more or less, uh, they have been very influential among neo-pagan heathens, we understand why we have such a great amount of assumptions towards heathenism as a whole and, and the pagan past, and why we have so many alternative meanings uh, precisely concerning the runes, and uh, why they often lead to a specific political ideology focused on nationalism and traditionalism, which again reflects the specific modern political view of this movement and not in truth focused on recovering the actual pagan past. We seem to have here a movement influenced by several 20th century currents. First, there is the growing enthusiasm for heathen slash pagan themes uh, surfacing from a Romantic period, from the 19th century Romantic Gothic revival revivalism of the 700s, and formulated to fit our contemporary society in the second half of the 20th century. Then we have traditionalism, originally based on the early 20th century perspectives of René Guinon, uh, and as you know it, an influential figure in the domain of mysticism, who greatly expressed his rejection of Western modernity. And finally, we have the left-hand path, formed in the 1960s and 1970s in American religious, esoteric and occult manifestations, for instance, such as Anton LaVey, the founder of the Church of Satan, and of course, uh, European manifestations as well, such as the um, Typhonian tradition of Kenneth Grant. So, within the Rune Guild, we see a lot of influence from these 20th century currents, which seem indeed to be the foundations of the Rune Guild. So, with this being said, we already start to understand that the Rune Guild, this organization, isn't particularly providing a thorough investigation on the actual Northern European pagan past, but it is, in fact, a modern movement, which is the product of several 20th century currents. And such 20th century religious, esoteric, philosophical and spiritual ideas have great impact upon those within this movement or this organization. And as such, their works and perceptions towards the pagan past is actually not impartial at all, but greatly influenced by these 20th century currents and less on the academic scientific work concerning the historical past. But, but let's give it a little bit of a, an historical background, shall we? Uh, we have important romantic movements in the late 18th and early 19th centuries, uh, when the church and Christianity in general is starting to lose its ground and people turn to alternatives, seeking their pre-Christian historical past. And it's precisely during this period that there is the revival of certain specific periods in history. Um, in the case of modern heathenism, there is a focus on the Gothic revival of the 700s, as was said before, and, of course, greatly romanticized to fit into the perspectives of the late 18th and early 19th centuries, particularly in its German version. The German Romantic movement turned to a romantic perspective of an old and native past not actually based on anything concrete, Mind that archaeology wasn't even a science yet, and it's actually important to reflect on that because archaeology by this time was solely done by amateurs and people mostly from nobility 
or with a significant social status, wealthy members of the patriarchy, who were only interested in finding treasure. And everything else in the archaeological record was destroyed, blown away, or purposely put aside. It was prestigious to have this hobby, to dig the past in search of, for treasure and, and bring it to a museum and uh, expose the great riches of the past, of a nation. So this romantic movement of the pagan past was really not at all focused on the truth, but on prestige and what they wanted to be true, and concoct romantic notions that fit into the patriarchal system of the 19th century. Romanticism during this time gave birth to modern nationalism. In the late 19th century Germany, the, Volkisch, the Volkische movement gave notions that simply satisfied the social and political perceptions and tensions of the period, concocting a national, ancestral and racial history of the folk and a folk spirit. A romantic unification under one single flag, a unification of a collective pagan past. Because we have to understand that Germany in the late 18th century and early 19th century was under a lot of political pressure and the need to find an identity, as it wasn't actually a country yet, but a series of several little reigns, so to speak, with their own administration. And many countries in Europe at this time, during this period, were actually seeking to find an identity so they could get rid of old crumbling empires. So this romantic movement uh, entertained notions of a united ancestral past, which just isn't true at all, historically speaking. And this Volkische, Volkisch movement uh, is precisely what gave rise to the English term Folkish, found in folkisms, or uh, Folkish modern religious manifestations, precisely derived from the Germanic ethno-nationalist movement. It doesn't mean ancestral practice, as some people still believe it does. It's a populist or nationalist movement and typically racist. Folkisms do not focus on the pagan past. They focus on romantic nationalist ideas of the 19th century. So here we have the romantic birth of neo-paganism, which sprouts from the fascination for nature and the ideas of nation and race, which were quite typical of this period all over Europe, actually. So we have our first important figure at this point to understand all of this, which is the Austrian Guido von Liszt, who was very important for the rise of modern heathenism. As you know it, he, he was the one to conceive the idea of an esoteric understanding of the runes. There wasn't this idea before him. And he combined this with Volkisch or Volkische ideas in his book Secret of the Runes. Das Geheimnis der Runen, uh, The Secret of the Runes, as I've said, published in 1988. And this gave rise to several Guido von Liszt societies in Germany in the early 1900s, and these developed practical techniques to reach the understanding of Guido von Liszt's runes. So, these several Germanic Romantic movements, uh, greatly based on nationalist and racial ideologies developed throughout the course of the 20th century until we reach the 1970s when we finally have the first Alzothru or Odinist heathen religious organizations mainly of the United Kingdom, the United States of America and Iceland but founded and developed independently but here's the thing, contrary to popular belief, it is in fact American Alzothru, not the British or the Icelandic ones, which has had the strongest influence on the development of European heathenism and neo-paganism as a whole. Uh, 
As you know, in Iceland since the 1970, since 1973, uh, Alsafru has been officially recognized as a religion having the right of providing legalized life rituals. This didn't happen in America. In America, the, the scenery is quite different. Probably the first Northern American heathen group was the one created by Stephen McNallan in the late 1960s, and it was called Viking Brotherhood. This group was registered as a religious organization in 1972, and uh, I repeat, religious organizations, uh, or organization and not an official religion. More or less at the same time, there is the Odinist Fellowship, which was founded in Florida in 1969. So we start to have our first problem in terms of defining Alzothru and or Odinist religious organizations in America. Because there is actually an internal conflict of sorts, <clears throat> sorry, uh, because these are organizations and not official religions. So there is often the tendency to have concrete separations from one organization to the next. It is hard at times to distinguish between politically racialist Odinism and the more apolitical also through. The Odinist Fellowship was a strictly racialist group while the Viking Brotherhood was not, or rather, not yet. Which is why the latter is, therefore, regarded to be the very first Alsothru group in America. But the Viking Brotherhood of Stephen McNown uh, was reformed as the Alsothru Free Assembly in 1966, and finally dissolved in 1986, precisely largely due to the political and racial and cultural tensions mentioned previously. But as you know, in 1994, Stephen McNallan founded the Alsothru Folk Assembly, AFA, which became a folkish hate group, highly folkish. Or in other words, it eventually succumbed to the racial and ethnicity approach. So it stopped being a more apolitical Alsothru group and became politically racialist, a folkism or Odinism, a white supremacist group. But I'm, I'm not going to focus on that today. That, that's not the point of this video. The point is the Rune Guild. So, uh, then we have the formation of the Alsothru Alliance from the former Vice President of the Odinist Fellowship. So, this new Alsothru Alliance had strictly a racialist agenda. So, it shouldn't even call itself Alsothru. And we have the Ring of Troth with a more cultural focus, uh, opposed to the folkish sector of heathenry. The Ring of Troth, nowadays known as the Troth, <laughs> was an organization founded by none other than Stephen Adred Flowers. As you know it, also famously known as Adred Thorson, which is one of the important members, the founder actually of the Rune Guild, now, due to Stephen Flowers' um, involvement in the Temple of Set, he became a controversial figure by, for many heathens. Aren't we all? <laughs> but um, subsequently, uh, discontinued his involvement with the Ring of Troth in 1995. As said before, the AFA was refounded by McNallan in the mid 1990s, and he was subsequently uh, been reported to have become involved in the Rune Guild itself. So, given this quick and general background, we have a couple of things to take into consideration. Modern Romantic Nationalist movements, which constructed a modern Romantic racial nationalist and traditionalist idea of a Germanic pagan past, subsequently leading to a total alternative pagan past, and this would eventually lead to two main opposing sides in the 70s in terms of hidden religious manifestations in the United States of America. On one side, the organizations interested in a cultural, apolitical focus, precisely to get away from the romantic uh, nationalist ideologies and try to achieve a more concrete historical past, 
And as such, we can label these concrete apolitical heathen religious movements as also through. And on the other side, organizations with a strictly racialist agenda. So they are the folkish or Odinist part of heathenry, white supremacists, even if they put also through in the name of their organizations. The members of such organizations would eventually split and create other organizations whose members eventually influenced one another and when two opposing ideas come together within a specific movement or a specific organization we have a mixture of ideas which is why it's hard to define what that movement is all about and that is the Rune Guild. But let's explore more. So, as was said before, the Rune Guild was founded in 1980 by Stephen Adred Flowers, notoriously known as Adred Thorson. And I am sure many of you have at least one of his books, but we shall get to that further ahead. <laughs> well, uh, the Rune Guild, this organization, was actually originally named the Institute of Runic Studies Alzothrum. Adred Thorson joined the Church of Satan in the early 1970s. A quick involvement, but it may have been actually an important step in his life, launching him into the love for the occult, which eventually led him to join the Temple of Set in 1984. A left-hand path. So, the Temple of Set, being a left-hand path organization, seems to have been actually quite significant for him, for, for Hedrick. Thorson, because uh, in, the, in the very same year he, he joined, uh, he was accepted into the Temple's Order of the Trapezoid, which mainly focused on Germanic mythology, precisely. So he became the Grand Master of the Order from 1987 until 1996, and the editor of its journal Runes from 1986 to 1999, 1991. Thorson himself attributes uh, great importance to his involvement in the Temple of Set uh, for the development of the Rune Guild itself, and remains a member, although he has since the mid-1990s largely withdrawn from active uh, participation in the Temple. So I, I'm not throwing assumptions into the air. These are his own words. Anyway, back in the late 70s, he got in touch with Stephen McNallan, and joined the AFA. When the AFA disbanded in 1986, Thorson founded the Ring of Truth. In his own words, this organization was a special project of the Rune Guild itself. It's important to take notice that Thorson is a recognized scholar of old Germanic language and mythology, having received his PhD at the University of Texas in 1984. 1980... yes, 1984. <laughs> so here's where we enter in, in, in the works of Hedrick Thorson. He's undoubtedly a great influence for many neo-pagans, especially in relation to esotericism. Stephen Flowers, or Hedrick Thorson, as I said, obtained a PhD in Germanic language in 1984. Um, with the study Runes and Magic, in fact highly criticized by academics, a work classified as speculative, as always. <laughs> However, many neo-pagan writers and esoteric writers continuously have published several works in which they refer Edward Thorson's own works as reliable sources. One of the most well-known authors in terms of works related to Alzothru is Diana Paxson. And she cites a lot, a lot of works by Edward Thorson, and often directs readers to and gives information about the Rune Guild. The Rune Guild is classified as an esoteric school, as well as a paganist and a radical traditionalist school, so not impartial at all, with a clear line of thought, even political, especially political, and using the runes to express that specific line of thought. 
It was originated by the inheritance of romantic impulses on paganism in the late 19th century, the fascination with nature and ideas of nation and race. Also inspired by an esoteric reaction by René Gunon, uh, questioning modernity, as well as on ideas of Satanism in the Church of Satan, of Anton LeVay, and of course the Temple of Set. The Rune Guild is based on a mixture of different currents. Therefore, all these works of an esoteric rather than academic character have passed through reliable works in relation to the historical study of the runes and the Northern European pagan past, which is not at all true. This really creates a series of problems in the neo-pagan world and in the study of the runes themselves, because the Rune Guild and Edward Thorson have built a perspective of the runes that is not at all the historical truth. A great amount of esoteric and occult influences that were linked to the runes. Once again, I repeat that I see nothing wrong with mixing the old with the new in an attempt to achieve spiritual knowledge, spiritual enlightenment. However, it is necessary to know how to distinguish what are modern esoteric currents and what the historical truth is, as far as we are able to know it. So both the Rune Guild and Edward Thorson have had an immense impact on neo-paganism, but it has led many people to misinterpret the historical or the, or the history of the runes and, and to lead people to a collective belief that the runes are highly magical symbols and everything is somehow connected in a way. There have been many assumptions that lead people to not believe or simply refuse to believe in scientific work in relation to the runes and even in relation to the pre-Christian past of Scandinavia. But I think the great problem here in this group uh, the uh, is the clear political influence due to Thorson's contact with Stephen McNallan and ideas of nas nationality and race, ethnicity and radical traditionalism. Because there, there are modern far-right white supremacist political ideologies brought to the rooms and into the, the Scandinavian studies, which in the past there was nothing of the sort at all. Building a completely alternative past based on modern nationalist far-right ideologies which distorts the actual pre-Christian Scandinavian and Germanic past. So that is a big problem. So it's small wonder uh, why in modern heathenry many people have the tendency, even unknowingly, to have a racist and white supremacist approach to paganism. Because they are being influenced by these works and by these people and by these organizations. And I admit that I have many of Edward Thorson's works. If I haven't read them all, well, <laughs> certainly I have read almost everything he wrote. But that's the thing. That is precisely why I have noticed all of all these influences that led him to create his works. Certainly, some of his insights are interesting, but you really have to read his works with a, a grain of salt or several grains of salt and be aware of the many 20th century currents that influenced Edward Thorson and subsequently influenced the entire Rune Guild organization and movement and the works they create and express to the public. And now, allow me to put aside neutrality uh, for, for a little while. As I said, I've read most of Edward Thorson's works. Sometimes, uh, indeed, uh, inevitably, he expresses historical content, but also, inevitably, he expresses a lot his own beliefs, reshaping an historical past to fit into his own ideas not just esoteric, but political ones as well. One thing is being opened about it and say that his works are purely his own perspectives on the matter, 
and another thing completely different is passing this as reliable sources of information on the Scandinavian and Germanic historical past, which clearly his works are not at all unbiased. Most of his works are about the Scandinavian and Germanic past, especially the runes. But of all the works I read from him, honestly, I personally think that his best book so far is Hermetic Magic, a postmodern magical papyrus of Haberis, which is not a book related to Old Norse belief at all. <laughs> he is good when writing about occult and esoteric currents, but it's a problem when such modern age thinking passes as reliable historical information. Which is precisely one of the reasons I have made that video uh, concerning uh, the common misconceptions about the runes. Because, obviously, people are influenced by these works and by these people and by these organizations, by, uh, by fantastical romantic ideas of the past, which, frankly, that's what most people want right now. Hungry for the spiritual, hungry for the magical. They just want to be lulled to sleep into the wonderland and, and forgot about, forget about reality. So the historical truth is a bit of a buzzkill, and I understand that. But I continue to say that there's nothing wrong with the mixture of several schools of thought and esoteric and occult currents uh, for the sake of spiritual awakening or enlightenment. But we do need to know how uh, and, and understand how to separate the historical truth from what we choose to believe based on personal experiences and our own approach to magic. But I also continue to underline that the political ideologies behind the Rune Guild and behind uh, Thorson and other organizations and other people are very dangerous, especially to those taking their first steps into paganism and to them it is given one specific political ideology rather than an historical truth of the past. And so people will grow up into paganism with a very wrong and twisted idea of what paganism is all about. As you have noticed, uh, as the name of the organization Rune Guild indicates, it is an organization and a movement focused on Germanic and Scandinavian mythology. Now, in the words of the Rune Guild and its members, the specific focus of this organization is on the Germanic slash Norse runes, which are regarded by this organization as, as far more than letters of an alphabet. Through intimate esoteric knowledge of the runes, the practitioner can know himself or herself and the secrets of the universe through the runes. The practice of the guild centers on a series of exercises called the, the Nine Doors of Midgard. Uh, on the website of the, the rune guild, you can find that the rune work is divided into rune thinking, which involves meditation and contemplation, uh, divination in the form of rune casting, Galdur, implying the verbal magical use of the runes, the manufacturing of rune talismans, and uh, self-transformational rune work. It's basically the internalization of the runes, as they say, uh, in a way that uh, lets, the, lets the person experience and activate the power of the runes within himself or herself, in order to affect change in the outer and inner worlds. These are the words of the Rune Guild and uh, of, of the mem members themselves. So, in other words, the Rune Guild is an initiatory organization. So, the question remains, is the Rune Guild hidden? Well, uh, there's no doubt that the Rune Guild clearly emphasizes the revivalist aspects of neo-paganism. The aim is to revive ancient pre-Christian religion. So in this aspect, we can perhaps characterize the Rune Guild as a neo-pagan organization. 
And since it is mostly focused on pre-Christian Scandinavian and uh, Germanic past, technically, <laughs> we could perhaps call it a modern heathen organization. However, even though the organization acknowledged uh, the gods and goddesses of the Germanic pantheon and the Nor Old Norse pantheon, uh, the main focus of the guild, of the, of the rune guild, is actually solely on the god Odin. The prominent focus is on the god Odin alone but not worshipping the worshipping of this deity. Rather, the deity functions as an archetype for the process of rune esoteric knowledge and transmutation. So even though we could characterize perhaps this organization as a heathen organization, it is in many ways different from most other heathen movements and neo-paganism as a whole. As the focus in this organization is on one single deity and to mimic the archetype of Odin as the master of the runes in order to achieve a greater understanding of the runes. That much is clear. Now, in terms of traditionalism, what can we say about the rune guild? Hedrick Thorson, on countless occasions, even in his own works, you can read them, clearly demonstrates the anti-democratic tendencies of radical traditionalism. Of course, this doesn't mark the actual position of the Rune Guild, the organization, uh, as, as a radical traditionalist, traditionalism. But in Thorson's own opinion, he believes that there was once a unified and coherent organized society of Rune Masters in ancient times. So the aim of the Rune Guild is to re-established the unified and coherent aspects of the ancient pre-Christian organization. Thorson also believes that this pre-Christian organization was an inter-tribal inter network of individuals dedicated to Walton, to Odin. So basically, in Thorson's views, old Germanic culture is not dead, it, it was never actually gone, but it lies on a dormant state. As such, it is possible to reawaken it in its true and original form. So it seems clear that this demonstrates the belief by the Rune Guild and by Thorson himself in the existence of a real tradition. So Thorson is very critical when it comes to heathenry as a whole and neo-paganism in general. He is technically against the merging of different religious traditions and he often points out how everybody else is wrong for not focusing on the real tradition and the revival of the real tradition. Which is curious because in his, his own works you can clearly see, uh, read, <laughs> a merging of different religions. He particularly likes to focus on Stendhal Galder, the Yerun Yoga. But as you know it, Stendhal Galder was created in Germany in the 1930s, and it is in great, great part actually based on Indian religious principles and discipline rather than actual Old Norse religious perceptions. So what's this idea of a real tradition of the past and the revival of a real tradition by Edward Thorson and his Rune Guild, and the, the fervent disdain for the merging of different systems of belief, when in fact the Rune Guild itself presents a merging of systems of belief and also a clear merging of modern, esoteric, occult and philosophical views of the 20th century. Not to mention that Hedrick Thorson himself, once again, is actually missing the historical religious background of the Old Norse and the Old Germanic peoples of the past, which was, as a matter of fact, a merging of different systems of belief, as has been shown on countless occasions by archaeology, anthropology, and also the study of the myths and the surviving written sources. In the pre-Christian Scandinavian and Germanic past, and pagan past as a whole for that matter, no one 
No one was subscribed to the same religion. In fact, in the case of pre-Christian Scandinavia, there wasn't even an idea of religion, let alone an organized tradition. It was all about the merging of different beliefs, a merging of different systems of belief. Precisely what we are doing nowadays in neo-paganism, merging things together and see what works best and what calls to us. This idea of a unique tradition and pure and an organized religious society under one single nation, one single banner, this is just romantic notions of the 19th century and not the historical truth. Folkism. So the Rune Guild presents an authentic tradition and the revival of this authentic tradition. It's interesting to see Thorson's, Edward Thorson's um, extensive critic of altars who do not adhere to his idea of an authentic tradition. In fact, he has an essay entitled How to be a heathen. You can read that on the website explaining what you should do to be a true heathen in his own view. He clearly demonstrates this expression of the desire to keep tradition in its pure form by his own words. Thorson and the Rune Guild are not actually reviving an old authentic tradition. They believe they are, but such a thing never actually existed. So his fervent criticism towards neo-paganism and his fervent need to establish an authentic tradition is actually what we can define as a cult. The Rune Guild organization is a cult and if you are not in tune or indeed if you do not agree with the Rune Guild's ideologies, you are not a true heathen and you are against the traditional community. Basically, this is a cult, because the cult leader is always right. Any ideas against the ideologies of the cult are wrong, and the cult leader even tells you how to be a true heathen by carefully following step by step the instructions of this romantic idea of an authentic tradition of the ancestral past. As said before, the Rune Guild is an initiatory organization and it has several levels for its members. Uh, you have the Gilder or Runer, uh, the, the Learner or Apprentice, uh, the Fellow or the, the Journeyman, uh, the Master, the Allurian and so on and so forth. Since 2007, the membership process proceeds in the, in the following way. The new member purchases associate membership and receives the Nine Doors of Midgard. I also have it. And the Gildis book, which is, uh, which is the membership handbook of the organization. Cool. The associate member then works on his or her own with the Nine Doors. They, uh, then the, the new member advances to the first regular level, which is the learner, if accepted as an apprentice by a rune master of the Rune Guild, of course. The learner level involves a basic learning period during which the member studies historical runology, the academic study of runes, as well as esoteric runology. Upon successfully completing one's apprenticeship, the member is accepted as a fellow in the Rune Guild, in the organization. From the fellow level onwards, the member is regarded as a full member. The master level is reached with uh, the production of a master work, which is assessed by a committee of three existing rune masters. This level signals that the member has achieved mastery of the runes and he or she is tasked with teaching more junior members of the Rune Guild. The highest levels signal more extensive knowledge of the runes, obviously. And then there are several levels for the master to achieve. It's an interesting organization, pretty interesting. 
But from the moment you have your own thought limited by what the organization dictates to be true or not, to be authentic or not, this expresses an unhealthy cultic line of thought. This tradition traditionalism expressed in the Rune Guild makes you wonder about the works of its members, especially by Edred Thorson. It's clear that this is an expression of a personal belief in what should be authentic and true based on the ideologies of the organization, rather than the actual historical truth. I'm sure many of us have read these works, but what we have re read is in great, great part an ideology and not an actual historical truth based on actual scientific work. I maintain what I said. One of Thorson's best works so far, in my opinion, isn't related to the old Norse pre-Christian past in the slightest. And this is scary because of the amount of global influence Thorson has had, as well as his rune guild. The amount of influence not only on the runes themselves, but on, the, on, on an alternative perception of the pagan past. It's scary how easily people are indoctrinated. Listen, I, I'm not telling you to stop reading these works, on the contrary. I'm just telling you to be attentive and be critical about everything you come about. It's actually important to be aware of the background in relation to Edward Thorson and the Rune Guild, and obviously other people and other organizations. So we might understand to where we are being led. So we might be more attentive when it comes to future contact with several ideas or organizations and perceptions. Not everything is as it seems to be. So it's small wonder why hiddenry is greatly focused on specific political ideologies, sometimes unknowingly, and paganism as a whole, actually. Nowadays, in plain 21st century, the great majority of neo-pagan notions are actually still the remains of a racial nationalist romantic ideology of the past, of the, of the 18th and 19th centuries. One thing about the Rune Guild that I appreciate is actually its left-hand approach. For an organization and for its founder to be so critical and showing clear disdain for the merging of religions and philosophies, the Rune Guild sure is an amalgamation of ideologies and philosophies. As said before, the criticism isn't actually towards the merging of ideas, but rather a criticism towards everything that this organization believes to be wrong and isn't in tune with their own mindset. A cult. <laughs> anyway, it's clear that the Rune Guild is indeed focused on the individual and his or her own spiritual progress and transmutation. In this organization's own views, Odin is not a god to be worshipped, but rather functions as a model for the personal spiritual development. Through the example set by this god, by Odin, the rune master can become as a god. The objective is to interiorize the archetype and reach enlightenment and become as a god. So only through walking a personal path, the the person achieves an important personal evolution. But this is perhaps the only clear left-hand path influence within the Rune Guild. Personal development and transmutation by seeking a solitary path, trying to achieve godhood and the refusal of worshipping. Of course, this left-hand path approach isn't typically of ancient paganism at all as it was really about worshipping and really about the community, so the total opposite. But, of course, not a totality of worship, but more often than not, it was about practical action towards the supernatural, involving 
offerings, uh, sacrifices, the idea of blood present in pre-Christian Old Norse religious manifestations, as you know it. Blood, sacrifice, something that isn't present within the Rune Guild. They do not sacrifice, they do not blot, because that requires worship and the individual uh, taking uh, physical action towards the supernatural. When the Rune Guild is all about incorporating Odin as the archetype of the Rune Master. So, in this way, yet again, the Rune Guild demonstrates another perspective, historically inaccurate, uh, concerning uh, paganism. So, their idea of an authentic tradition of the past isn't authentic at all. But I do appreciate this left-hand approach. But I believe we can create a balance in our personal development. We can still take care of the community and have a, a more general collective approach. But also, each one of us can and should seek out what best calls to us and create our own path to reach enlightenment or, at the very least, to reach spiritual freedom. As I usually say, I do not follow any path but my own. But this individual development within the Rune Guild, within this organization, is sort of nonsensical, actually, in the sense that, on one hand, it promotes an individual development, but at the same time, on the other hand, <laughs> you are not a true heathen if you are not in tune with the ideologies of the organization. Still, there's not enough to actually call this organization a real left-hand path. But we see the influences in there. Mainly due to, possibly, obviously, Edward Thorson's involvement with both the Church of Satan and the Temple of Set. So, the Rune Guild cannot really be characterized as a neo-paganism. Actually, Thorson himself hates the designation. There's not enough to also call it a left-hand path, but there is a considerable amount of evidences to show us that it is a radical traditionalism in many aspects. So I would say the organization Rune Guild is in fact an esoteric movement, a modern esoteric movement, which draws on elements of several esoteric currents, even though its founder is against the merging of esoteric currents and religions, but the Rune Guild is precisely that. So as said before, that sort of criticism on something Thorson and the Rune Guild also do shows yet again the radical traditionalist approach of the movement. The typical idea of often used by nationalist white supremacists, if you are not with us, you are against us, or if you don't like it here, go away. So, it's not the revival of an authentic tradition of the past, as they say, but in truth a, a contemporary esoteric group. And it's important to understand that and stop with the assumptions of a real and true and authentic tradition of the ancestors. All right, my dear friends, I hope you have enjoyed this video. I hope it was useful and a sort of an eye-opener. Thank you so much for watching. See you on the next video. And as always, up for you.